Shalom, my friends, and welcome to Weekly Parsha with Yehudi Yisrael. This week's Parsha is Bechukotai. This is mainly dealing with Leviticus chapter 26. And this is what is known as the Tochacha. We discuss the blessings and the curses that will befall Israel should they follow the Torah or should they not follow the Torah. What are the consequences of that? And this is sort of a mini version of what is later described in the book of Deuteronomy in more detail. Um, so this is dealing primarily with Leviticus chapter 26, which if you've watched my other videos, I have been speaking about pretty frequently lately. This describes the formula for sin, how you deal with it during times of exile. Now, of course, we know Christians claim that the only way to deal with sin is to believe that Jesus died for your sins on a cross and that he resurrected and he's some sort of God-man. So we know that's not the case because this book of Leviticus and the book of the Torah, the Hebrew Bible, none of it prescribes that as a valid method of dealing with sin, especially during times of exile like today. So let's get into the Parsha. It says, if you follow my statutes and observe my commandments and perform them, I will give you your rains in their proper time. The land will yield its produce and the tree in the field will give forth its fruit and your threshing will last until vengeance. So basically saying all these wonderful things will happen if you keep the Torah, right? So following the Torah gives good things. And then it discusses, I will grant you peace in your land. You will lie down no one will frighten you. I will remove wild beasts from the land and no army will pass through your land. You will pursue your enemies and they will fight with the sword before you. Five of you will pursue a hundred and a hundred of you will pursue 10,000. Your enemies will fall by the sword before you. So this can describe, I think the best example of this would be during King Hezekiah's reign when he didn't even lift a finger, said a prayer. And Israel was in such a great state of spirituality during that time, during you know, King Hezekiah, that's probably the closest thing we ever had to the Messianic era described in the Tanakh, aside from maybe King Solomon's era. Um, but, you know, within the context of, you know, enemies attacking us and them being just absolutely obliterated. Um, and I will turn toward you and I will make you fruitful and increase you and I will set up my covenant with you. So a lot of benefits to following the Torah. You will eat very old produce and you will clear out the old for, for the new and will place my dwelling in your midst. And my spirit will not reject you, right? So it's talking about the Mishkan or ultimately the temple. And I will walk among you and I will be your God and you will be my people. And I am the Lord, your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt. So it's just describing, you know, God taking us out of slavery and bringing us out, you know, ultimately to the land of Israel. But if you do not listen to me and do not perform all these commandments, so this is the where we're discussing the curses, and if you despise my statutes and reject my ordinances, not performing any of my commandments, whereby thereby breaking my covenant, then too, I too will do the same to you in order upon you to shock and consumption, fever, diseases that cause hopeless and longing and depression. You will sow your seed in vain and your enemies will eat it. So a lot of horrible things will happen. I will set my attestation against you and you will be smitten before your enemies. Your enemies will rule over you and you will flee, but no one will be pursuing you. And if during these you will not listen to me, I will add another seven punishments for your sins. I will break the pride of your strength and make your skies like iron and your land like copper. Your strength will be expanded in vain and your land will not yield its produce. Neither will the tree of the earth give forth its fruit. So all these horrible things. And if you treat me in happenstance and you do not wish to listen to me, I will add seven punishments corresponding to your sins. So there's... The rabbis describe kind of what that goes into. I will incite the wild beasts of the field against you and they will 
review, utterly destroy your livestock and diminish you, your roads will become desolate. And if these, if through these, you still will not be chastised to return to me. And if you continue to treat me in happenstance, then I too will treat you in happenstance. And I will again add seven punishments to your sins. So it's compounding more to the punishment. And I will bring upon you an army that avenges the avenging of the covenant. And you will gather into your cities and I will incite the plague in your midst. And you will be delivered into the enemy's hands. So this is really getting bad, right? When I break for you the staff of bread and ten women will bake your bread in one oven. And they will bring back your bread by weight and you will eat and still not be satisfied yet not be satisfied and if despite this you still don't listen to me so it's getting worse and worse and worse still treating me in happenstance i will treat you with a fury of happenstance adding again seven chastisement to your sins okay so that seven keeps coming up interesting you will eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters you will eat this is pretty awful stuff it's describing right this is like the end of the rope this is basically like according to some uh descriptions of when i can't remember if it was the first temple or the second temple but the, the famine was so bad that that was actually what what actually ended up happening um which is absolutely horrible um i will demolish your edifices and cut down your sun idols and i will make your corpses upon the corpses of your idols and my spirit will reject you I will lay your cities waste and make your holy places desolate and it will not partake of your pleasant fragrances. And I will make the land desolate and it will become desolate also of your enemies who live in it. And I will scatter you among the nations, right? So this is referring to the exiles, right? And I will unsheathe the sword after you. Your land will become desolate and your cities will be laid waste pay attention to the next few verses because this is describing the exile already right we're scattered to the nations how do you deal with this right how do you remedy this situation when the sin gets so bad what does the torah prescribe as the solution it says then the land will be appeased regarding its sabbaticals during all the days that it remains desolate while you are in the land of your enemies the land will rest and thus appease its sabbaticals it will rest during the days that it remains desolate, whatever it had not rested on your sabbaticals when you lived upon it. So they're discussing the Shemitah year that wasn't kept. And this is relating, I think, to the destruction of the first temple as it's described. Um, some, you know, this is describing, yeah, so you see the rabbinic commentaries describing how this actually played out in that Babylonian exile with the 70 years based on not keeping the Shemitah year. It refers to Ezekiel 4, 4 through 5, where it describes Ezekiel. He was suffering for the, he was atoning for the sins through his suffering, right? Where it explicitly says, and you shall lie on your left side, symbolizing Israel and the 10 tribes. Now I've made you for the years of their iniquity, the number of their days. This is 390 days, and you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. Right, So this is describing the atoning process of the suffering of Ezekiel, of how, how Israel was ultimately atoned for. Now that's one way to atone for sin, but there's another way that is prescribed here, right? And you'll see in the subsequent verses. And those of you who survive, I will bring fear in their hearts in the land of their enemies, and the sound of a rustling leaf will pursue them. They will flee as one flees from the sword, and they will fall, but there will be no pursuer. Each man will stumble over his brother as if from the sword, but without a pursuer, you will not be able to stand up against your enemies. You will become lost among the nations, and the land of your enemies will consume you. Because of their iniquity, those of you who survive will rot away in the lands of your enemies. Moreover, they will rot away because of the iniquities or their fathers are still in them. So people who don't repent of the iniquities of their fathers, they will end up uh, in a very horrible place. But here's the solution to that. They will then confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers, their betrayal that they dealt me. And they also treated me as happenstance. So this is describing how to reverse this curse. 
then I too will treat them in happenstance and bring them back while in the land of their enemies. If then their clogged heart becomes humbled, then their sufferings will gain appeasement for their iniquity. So that is deal how you deal with the sin, right? And I remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember the land for the land will be bereft of them, appeasing its sabbaticals when it had not been desolate of them. And they will gain appeasement for their iniquity. This is how you deal with the sin. This was all in retribution for their having despised my ordinances and their retribution for having rejected my statutes. But despite all of this, while they are in the land of their enemies, I will not despise them, nor will I reject them to annihilate them, thereby breaking my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God. I will remember the covenant I made with their ancestors and I took out of the land of Egypt and before the eyes of the nations to be a God to them. I am the Lord. These are the statues and ordinances and the laws that I gave between that the Lord gave between himself and the children of Israel on Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. Now, I want to go back and reflect on this. I brought this up in my debate with Radar Apologetics, and he started emphasizing the idea that this is linked back to the merit of the patriarchs. Once again, even if you're arguing that this is based on the merit of the patriarchs, it is still also based on the humbling of our hearts and our confession of iniquity of our own iniquity and the iniquity of our fathers. That is what this is dependent upon in order to receive this forgiveness of sin, the appeasement for our iniquities, as it explicitly states here in these verses, right? That is how you do it, through confession of sin and humbling of your heart. You do not need Jesus' blood. Yes, you invoke the merit of the patriarchs, but the patriarchs did not believe that Jesus died for their sins on a cross. So why would we? That's not the formula that, that God prescribes according to the Torah. So when I had my discussion with that Catholic Jewish person who was claiming that it's not sanctioned by Torah to, you know, use confession of sin and humbling of our heart as a means of dealing with sin and that you need a temple and you need Jesus to die for your sins on a cross, of course, you don't need that during times of exile. That's not what God expects of us. And nowhere does God ever prescribe Jesus dying for your sins on a cross as a valid need, you know, as the only way to deal with sin, right? You can say that the suffering of the righteous can atone for sin, but not that it's exclusive to one person and that you have to believe in, in that one person dying on a cross. No, that, that is not how the Torah describes dealing with sin. Primarily what we do is confess our sins and we humble our hearts. And that is how we are brought back to the land. And that's how the second temple was eventually built. So that's the formula for this right here. You can watch my other videos to see me reference the prophets who, well, you know, in Jeremiah chapter 29, you have that echoed, you know, pray to me and I will hear you and I will bring you back. And it's the same thing. It's literally just echoing the same message from the Torah. That's why Hosea chapter 14 describes taking words with yourselves to you know basically it says that god will forgive your iniquity based on what it says in leviticus 26 humbling your heart confessing your sin that's how you deal with it that's how you return to god genuinely during times of exile so moving on to leviticus chapter 27 so god is talking to moses describing a man expressing vows so it says the fixed value of a male shall be as followed from 20 years until 60 years old. The value is 50 shekels according to the Holy Shekel. And if she's a female, it's about 30 shekels. And if a person is five years to 20 years old, the value of a male shall be 20 shekels. Fine, okay. If a person is one month old until five years old, so it's just giving different values of these uh, different people. <laughs> um, but if he is too poor to pay the valuation, he shall stand him before the Cohen, and the Cohen shall evaluate him according to how much he is vowing his value can afford. So this is dealing with, with the vows. And if an animal whose type is fit is brought as an offering to the Lord, whatever part of it the person donates to the Lord, he shall become holy. So then it's describing substitutions for the animals. And 
making sure it's if it's any unclean animal whose type shall not be brought as an offering before the one who shall stand before stand up the animal before the cone and the cohen shall evaluate it whether it's good or bad like the evaluation shall you deal with the value of of the animal and it says adding a fifth to its value okay so a little mathy here <laughs> If a man consecrates his house to be holy to the Lord, then Cohen shall evaluate it good or bad. So basically saying that the, the Cohen deals with that. It's interesting. It says adding a fifth to its valuation of money. Okay, interesting. That seems to be a recurring theme here. So then it's talking about consecrating a field and the valuation of sowing. So this is more nitty-gritty mathy sort of things <laughs> homer barley seeds at 50 50 silver shekels if he consecrates his field when from the yovel year the jubilee it shall remain, remain at its full valuation okay interesting so that's um when the yovel year had ended okay so it's dependent on that but if he consecrates the field after the yovel the jubilee the Cohen shall calculate the money for him according to remaining years until the next Jubilee year, and it shall be deducted from the valuation. You guys are mathy. I guess you enjoy this part. The, this part gets a little dry for me, honestly. <laughs> it's Torah, though, so we got to love it. <laughs> if the one who consecrated it redeems the field, he shall add a fifth. Okay, more of that fifth. If he does not redeem the field, then he has sold the field to someone else and will no longer be revealed. But when the field leaves it in the Jubilee, it shall be holy to the Lord, like the field devoted. His inherited property shall belong to the Kohen. I don't want to bore you with too many details about that. You can go into more detail on that if you are interested. More consecrations of fields. Okay. So this is if it consecrated the Lord of the field that he had acquired, but it is not a part of his inherited property, the Kohen shall. Okay, more you go into the Kohen common theme is going to the Cohen and he evaluates based on if it's the year of the Jubilee or if it's not and it says however firstborn animal that must be sacrificed as a firstborn the Lord to the Lord no man may consecrate whether it be a sheep oxen belongs to the Lord okay if someone consecrates an unclean animal more of that fifth valuation okay okay or we'll keep <laughs> Sorry, guys, I know this might be a little bit hard to relate to, but yeah, this is Torah. However, anything that a man devotes to the Lord from his property, whether a person, animal, or part of his inherited field, shall be sold, nor shall it be redeemed, for all things are holy of holies to the Lord. All devoted things are holy of holies to the Lord. Okay. Awesome. So... Finish off this Parsha with the final Aliyah. And if he consecrates the Lord a field that he had acquired that is not a part of his inherited property, the Lord. <laughs> oh, wait. Actually, I think I just read that. Meant to click on this. Any devoting of a person who has not been devoted need not be redeemed, for he is. Okay, interesting. To be put to death. Um, any tithe of land whether it be from the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, it is the Lord's. It's holy to the Lord. If a man redeems some of his tithe and adds, he shall add a fit to it. Any tithe the cattle or flock all pass under the rod. The tenth shall be holy to the Lord. He shall not inspect a tithe animal for a good or bad one, nor shall he offer a substitute for it, nor shall he replace it. And when a replacement of holy is cannot be redeemed. These are the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses to tell the children of Israel on Mount Sinai. So that is this Parsha. I hope this video has been a blessing to you all. Shalom Aleichem.